Uh, for more, though, on the impact of the latest WikiLeaks revelations on U.S. national security, we're joined by the former Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff in an exclusive interview. He's also the chairman and the founder of the Chertoff Group, which provides advisory services on security. Michael, great to have you with us. Good to be on. Um, you know, we were quoting earlier that the Turkish foreign minister called this the 9-11 of diplomacy. Would you go that far? I think it's overstated, um, but I understand that uh, people are disturbed about the fact that confidential communications uh, that reveal something about the nature of our uh, secret relationships have now been exposed. So it's clearly damaging, but I don't think I'd compare it to a, a catastrophe. Well, has our national security been breached in any way from this? I think the issue is less that uh, classified information has been released and more that people are going to be very reluctant in the future to cooperate with us if they feel that things they want to do confidentially are going to be exposed to the world. Sometimes there are political ramifications, sometimes there are things that have to be done in a way that it are, is below the radar. And if there's no confidence that we can keep secrets, that ultimately hurts us. But we're talking about at the lower level, though, Michael, right? We're not talking about the leaders. We're talking about lower levels and not cooperating. Well, but here's the problem. The problem is the leaders wind up being in meetings with others who are taking notes. Those notes ultimately get put into cables. And what is exposed is what uh, one leader of one country said to an American diplomat or even an American president. Mm -hmm. And that means in the future, when we do need to ask someone to do a favor quietly, it's going to be very difficult for them. That's going to hurt us in counterterrorism. Where is that going to be most difficult, as you can see? I think you've seen a lot of things come out of the Middle East. Uh, I don't think it's a great surprise that the countries in the Gulf and, and the Middle East are very much afraid of Iran, but I think some of the candid comments probably will be embarrassing, and I think there'll be a, a reluctance over a period of time to be quite so forthright with our diplomats because of the concern about uh, secrecy. Yes, I mean, some of that language was very frank in fact. Uh, Michael, if you were back at the uh, Homeland Security uh, offices now, what would you be doing? I think I'd, I'd do pretty much what Secretary of State Clinton did, which is I would get out way ahead of the release. I'd call all of my counterparts and interlocutors and warn them about what was coming. I, you know, obviously they know sometimes when people write these things up, they use a little bit of purple prose, so I try mm -hmm. to defuse that. That's really all you can do. Would you apologize? I think I would apologize. Now, obviously it's not the U.S. government's fault that this got out, but it does raise a serious question about the security of our internal systems where apparently a private first class can get, can get into hundreds of thousands of cables and download them. And, and frankly, that's where the apology ought to be, is a failure to maintain an adequate internal security system to make sure these things are not open to anybody who gets on the network. Well, are you surprised that that breakdown in process happened, that this private could get that information? I am, I am pretty surprised, frankly. Um, it was one thing when uh, the private, and apparently this private first class, divulged things that were in the military system that were in the particular theater of operations. Right. But now he seems to have been in the State Department, who knows where else he was, and why he was allowed or why he was able to get from his area of operation all across the government raises a serious question about do we have appropriate compartmentalization? Well, well that's the thing. Is this pervasive? I mean, when you were at the White House or when you were at the administration, did you believe that there were leaks like this or did you believe that there were holes in the process like this? Well, we, we didn't have a leak anything like this uh, when I was in the administration, but I think we have recognized over the last several years that the issue of cybersecurity requires us to look at our internal processes and not merely our external processes. You know, one bad apple uh, getting into a system with a thumb drive can do a lot of damage. A lot of times people think of cybersecurity in terms of defend the network electronically. Right. But sometimes it's the very simple security about having an audit trail to make sure somebody's not in a place they shouldn't be. Or make them, most... making sure that somebody's managed properly right. then and tracked. Right. right. So it's access control, it's audit control, and it's basic stuff. But if you don't have it, someone can do a lot of damage, and this proves it. Michael, reading through everything that's been leaked, I mean, what has been most surprising to you? Well, I can't say I was terribly surprised by anything. I mean, I, I, I think, as I say, we knew the Middle Eastern countries were very concerned about Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew that there was difficulty getting other countries to take Guantanamo detainees, right. much as they might criticize us for holding the detainees. So uh, there's nothing... But what that... about China, though? I mean, the fact that China has essentially been enabling... Uh, the shipments of weapons parts, at the very least, to Iran. Well, again, I have to say, I don't know that I was shocked by that. Maybe others are. Um, I think what this does do is put a lot more detail on things that we might have suspected or things we might have inferred from what's going on in the world. But what it tells us again is that a lot of countries play a double or triple game. On the one hand, they're cooperating with us, mm -hmm. but they're also pursuing interests that may be uh, adverse to ours. 
We see that uh, with respect, obviously, to, <clears throat> to China. We see it with respect to other countries as well. And part of the reason these cables ought to be kept private is because we're now revealing to the world that we know some of what they're doing. It's like playing poker with somebody, right. and all of a sudden someone divulges what your poker hand is. So then the trust is hard to rebuild? I think Do you think we're getting ahead of it? I think we're going to have some trouble with trust. I, I think, frankly, in the long run, other countries will recognize that what we've got in our cables is probably no different than what they have in theirs. I think Secretary Clinton said that one of her counterparts said, well, you ought to see what we write about you. But it does, it, it does raise a, a fundamental question. You cannot conduct diplomacy or intelligence activities without the ability to keep those confidential. And if we cannot police our own house, then we don't become uh, viewed as trustworthy partners and colleagues. And it will, <clears throat> will take a little bit of time to rebuild it, this. But, but there's no alternative, though, Michael, <clears throat> is there? I mean, you can't stop sending the cables or No, you can't. Like that. What you do have to do <clears throat> is you've got to build a security architecture. And also, we've got to go after the uh, people who are responsible for the leak and throw the book at them, which is what I hope we're going to do. Michael, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Really appreciate that insight.